to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger, and uh, it's I guess it's Labor Day. Hope you're having a great day. This is our live Q&A. And uh, for those already joining, if you can just give me a thumbs up. I see that there's some, already some great questions in, in the chat. You guys, you beat me to the, you were here before I was. And that's okay. That's good. But uh, let's see. If I can get a thumbs up from, oh, there we go. David, thank you, Steve. Okay. So I'm going to dive right in and start with uh, the topic that I mentioned at the top uh, in the title of the live Q&A. And by the way, New Retirement is the sponsor. They sponsored this channel last month, and we're going to do that again this month. And um, it's a tool that I use to plan retirement. We're actually going to talk a little bit ab about it. Um, but you can check out New Retirement with the link below this video. I think they they do a great job of uh, giving us as, as a complete retirement planning tool as about as complete as you can get, I think. And I've used just about all of them. There are other good ones too, by the way, but I really like new retirement. And it's actually useful for today's topic. The question, as you saw from the title was, how long should we plan to live? When we're you know, trying to figure out financially if we've got enough money and if, we can, if we're ready to retire, whatever age you are, do you assume you're gonna live to be 90, 95, 100, 105? What, how do we figure that out? And the topic came to my mind because of this paper, which you probably, I don't know if you can read that. It's okay, I could have brought it, brought it up on the screen. You're underestimating longevity and how uncertain it is. Uh, this was, what was the date of this paper? Oh, this year, about a month ago. And uh, the basic ideas behind this paper was, look, what some folks will do is say, you know, life expectancy in the US is in the mid to, to late 70s. Uh, it's actually down a bit because of COVID. And they'll say, okay, so, I'll, you know, if I assume I'm going to live to 90, that's pretty good. I mean, the odds are I won't live to 90. Of course, I might. I might live older than that, but that seems reasonable. And the point of this paper is, yeah, it's not really reasonable. That's not good enough. And that's particularly true if you have a significant other, because the odds of at least one of you living past 90 or even past 95 are pretty significant. They go through the numbers, but we're talking, you know, a 25% chance of living well, in, one of you living well into your 90s. And um, depends exactly what data set you use for longevity. It does vary. And they um, they mentioned the Social Security Administration, which has a longevity um, schedule, I guess. I guess that's what you'd call it. And uh, the point that they make is, you know, that's a starting point, but there are at least two things the Social Security Administration's longevity analysis doesn't include. One is medical improvements, healthcare improvements. And um, there's, you know, different views as to how that will affect longevity going forward. But pretty much everyone that thinks about this, uh, you know, and is paid to think about this says, yeah, that's going to extend life. Uh, and the other thing is wealth. Wealthy people live longer. Now, we, you know, we can get into how you define wealth. I, they're not talking about Elon Musk. Uh, kind of wealth. Uh, probably most people that spend a Labor Day evening watching a YouTube channel about retirement and investing probably would fall into that category. I'm going to guess a lot will. They don't specifically define wealth, but uh, those that have the money to afford, you know, good medic medical uh, care and good health insurance. Of course, when you're 65 and older, you have Medicare. Um, uh, just the data tells us you live longer. Uh, and so their point was, look, you really need to plan to live to be at least 95, maybe even 100. Now, what does that mean as a practical matter? And this is the point that I don't see discussed enough. I'm sure I'm not the only one that's thought this. But one approach would be, let's just assume we're going to live to be 100. If that's, you know, that seems fairly conservative. Again, I guess, you know, people do live longer than that, but let's just, for the sake of argument, say that 100 is a good, you know, reasonable conservative assumption. What you could do in a, in a planning tool like new retirement, although new retirement's not built quite this way, but uh, more like a Maxify, uh, it is built this way, where you could tell Maxify, I'm going to live to be 100, and it will analyze everything in your retirement plan based on that assumption, including how much money from your savings you can spend each year, uh, you know, without going broke, 
when you should claim Social Security, whether you should buy an annuity, right? Um, you could even use that assumption to determine if you have this option, whether to take a lump sum pension or you know monthly checks for the rest of your life. The problem I have with that, on, on the one hand, it's good. I think every retirement plan, in fact, I want to do a video on how to stress test a retirement plan. Uh, I, may, I, may, I may get it done this week. But one of the things I'll talk about in that video is, what if you live to be 100? We need to stress test our retirement plan. We probably won't live to be 100, but we might, right? So we want, we're going to stress test it. So we want our plan to be able to survive uh, if we should live to be 100. But that doesn't mean that we need to assume we're going to live to be 100 for every single calculation in the plan. If you think about an annuity, if you're 65 and you're going to do an analysis, should I buy an annuity or some of some amount? And you assume you're going to live to be 100, I can tell you the math is going to come out. Yeah, buy the annuity because you're going to live well past your life expectancy, well past the life expectancy that the insurance company is going to use to price your annuity. You know, you're going to be, you know, cash and checks for three and a half decades if you're 65. Yeah, you should buy an annuity. It makes all kinds of sense. But of course, we might not live to be 100. And so what I think we need to do is figure out where we need to make assumptions that we're going to live to be 100 just to get our entire plan to a point where we could survive financially if that happens. So that might mean, it could mean claiming Social Security with the assumption you're going to live to be 100, which if you're single is likely going to push you out to 70 before you claim. And I think that may be a good outcome for a lot of people. If, you, if, you, if you're married, you have a significant other, uh, when the, uh, the 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 spouse who doesn't make as much money should claim could be a little different. That gets a little complicated. But um, and if you if you take that and say uh, uh, maybe that alone, maybe that assumption alone, and you wait until you're 70, you can go to the SSA Social Security Administration. You can get an estimate of what your Social Security payment will be if you wait until you're 70. You can plug that. If you look at something like I'll just show you a new retirement. Uh, you plug in under assumptions is where you plug in your, your age, where, how long you're going to live to. This is just a demo account. This is just fake data. Uh, so uh, there's a 90, I've got 92 and 95, right? But you can change that, right? But then on income, you can go in here and you can work through how you want to claim Social Security. And you can say, well, I'm, I want to claim it at 70, right? And they'll actually walk you through screens to, to, to help you out, help you determine that. In fact, I think it's in Explorers. Yeah, they have a Social Security Explorer down here that can help you with the different ways in which you know you might think about claiming Social uh, Security. But but my point is this: you may get comfortable and have a plan that will work, even if you live to be 100, without first assuming you'll live to be 100 and then doing an analysis as to whether you should buy an annuity. So the way I think about it with new retirement is. I would start a base plan. This is what this one is. I would assume, uh, you know, what they what they propose for. Um, let's see here. Let me go back to assumptions for your longevity. What they say is, look, assume your life expectancy plus ten years. I think that's a reasonable assumption. And depending on your age, it might put you somewhere in the low ninety. Uh, yeah, because you're, you're depending on your age. Life expectancy is in the mid to upper seventies, but that's someone who's born today. If you're 65, you've already avoided death for 65 years. So your life expectancy is going to be different, probably in the low to mid 80s. So if you added 10 years low to mid 90s, I think it's perfectly fine to start with that as a baseline assumption. But then when we go to stress test it, at least the way we would do it in new retirement is we'd say, okay, we want to create a new scenario, right? Uh, and we'll call it uh, living live to 100. We're going to import data from our baseline and create it. And we can go to it, live to be 100. And at the moment, it's identical to our baseline. We haven't changed anything, right? But see, this is the nice thing about tools like new retirement. And by the way, you can do this with Empower and uh, uh, Projection Lab does it and uh, Maxify does it. So the, the basic concept is the same. I do like the interface with new retirement. Oh, I like some of the interfaces of the others as well. Um, but the point is, I could come down to assumptions now and say, wait a minute, what if what if we both live to be 100? All right, and I go to my overview. Well, it, 
this is the interesting thing about stress testing. And this is, again, just one way to stress test a retirement plan. We went from 87% chance of success to 84. Does that surprise you? It kind of surprises me that, that our, our, cha our chance of failure which really is just a the chance that we're going to have to make some adjustment to our plan because we're really not going to fail, right? We're not going to do a Thelma and Louise with our retirement spending and just go broke and you know car goes over the cliff. Uh, we're going to make adjustments if things really go poorly for us. But it only it only dropped at three percent. It's kind of interesting to me. Of course, this is all demo data, and you know your own plan. You would know the data really well. Um, but but this is the kind of thing that I think these sorts of tools can help us. The big takeaway, whatever tool you use, or if you don't use any tool, I don't know, is that one, we, we need to be prepared to live to be at least 100. And, and how are we going to deal with that financially? But two, in answering that question, we don't have to assume we'll live to be 100 for every purpose in a retirement plan. Start maybe with just your base plan, what happens. You might decide, I don't need to make any adjustments. I can tell you if most of your spending comes from your savings, and you're only spending 2%, put it in a new retirement, but I'm pretty confident you'll do just fine if you live to be 100. But depending on how much of your nest egg you're spending each year, maybe you won't. So then you can go step by step. All right, let's change how we're claiming Social Security, perhaps. Uh, maybe we reduce our spending just a little bit. You know, there are, there are options here. And then, of course, it could be maybe we should buy an annuity, not with all of our nest egg, I wouldn't think, uh, but maybe with some of it. And by, the, by the way, you can then also game it out where, well, I'll buy an annuity, but I won't buy it for five years. Or I'll buy an annuity, but I'll get a deferred annuity. And I don't really know why I'm going back and forth with my head like this, but I am. Okay, that's all I got to say about that. Hopefully you found that helpful. All right. So I want to get to your questions now, you know, the important stuff. Um, let me see if I can get to the first one that was at us see here. So a few of them, I think, got cut off where I can't show them to you, but I can read them. By the way, if you're new to the chat, new to the live uh, Q&A, in the chat, just put at Rob Berger, ask me anything. It could be a question, just a topic you want me to cover. Um, you know, I'm not a financial advisor. I've been investing for a long time. I read a lot about this stuff, but keep that in mind. Um, but I do my best to help folks out, and there you go. So Mr. Mike says, what are your thoughts on wealth after retirement and before we cast off our earthly chains? I feel like Ebenezer Scrooge sometimes trying to grow my pile of coin, coins I hoard for no good reason. Well, I do think uh, for a lot of people, myself included, transitioning from a, being a saver to being a spender is not easy. Um, and it's been a process for me. That being said, I'm not really a die with zero kind of guy uh, because I don't equate living a full life with spending all my money. Now, you know, everyone's different. Maybe you have hobbies that are expensive. Maybe you love to travel and that's expensive. I don't by and large have expensive hobbies um, at all, actually. And so, um, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to just spend money for the sake of spending it. Uh, now, I, where I will spend money is for convenience. Uh, that, that that I will spend money on. Uh, but the bigger question, I think, Mr. Mike, is are you content? You know, if you're content, then keep growing your pile of coins. Why not? Um, but that's an individual choice, of course. So, okay. Next one. In a minute here, I'll be able to show you some of these questions on the screen, but not yet. This is from, uh, I guess... Frost heaven, maybe. Hi, Rob. 63 and newly retired. Our estimated tax payments reti required throughout the year. They're getting 30,000 30, in Social Security, 35,000 from an IRA, $5,000 in annual federal tax. Well, uh, they could be. Uh, you can use tax software to figure that out, like TurboTax. Or, of course, you can, if you have someone prepare your taxes, they can tell you. Um, I would think, you, you know, I, so I don't I don't know the answer. You'd have to do the calculations. But yeah, if you owe if you owe too much, yeah, there would be penalties if you don't pay the estimated taxes. There are sort of uh, safe harbors based on last year's taxes um, uh, that you can use. But yeah, there could be is the short answer. So there you go. 
Mike, another Michael says, why not utilize a, a home equity line of credit instead of having an emergency cash fund in retirement? Um, when I was getting out of debt, my wife and I, I did rely on a home equity line of credit, among other things, as an emergency fund. It's not foolproof. If you recall from the 08 crisis, a lot of home equity lines of credit got shut down. They would, they would, as soon as you made payment on it and reduce the balance, they would reduce your credit limit. So, and, and that's, by the way, that could be when you need it the most. So I personally would be uncomfortable having zero dollars in an emergency fund and relying entirely on some type of line of credit, whether it's a HELOC or something else. Uh, so, um, and by, by the way, even if you relied on it and then needed it, where would you get the money to pay it off? I mean, it, I, you know, presumably from your investments. So at some point, you're going to have to pull the money out to pay to pay uh, the debt back. So, you know, I'm not one that would completely rule out that idea, at least in part. But I can tell you it's not what we're doing. And we could. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it. But I think in times of stress, it could be a problem. Now, Steve here, I wish I could put this comment up. Oh, wait, here it is. I, I, I think I've caught up. Go Bucks, OSU grad. Um, I wasn't thrilled with the game on Saturday. I mean, it was 23 to three, I think was the final score. So some would say that's, you know, pretty comfortable, but the offense looked a little rusty. And I see that I could have been showing you these questions, but Dave got one in and it didn't show up over here. It doesn't matter. What is a reasonable allocation when one retires for a percentage in Roth, traditional non-qualified brokerage account? So Dave, I just did a video on this, right? I mean, whatever your allocation is, is what it is, right? You can't really do much about it. I mean, I understand you could do a Roth conversion to move traditional to Roth. You could decide which one you're gonna spend from, right? But the video I did was from the perspective of, of making contributions to one of these three. Uh, so you can check that out in the, in the channel. Uh, I just published it a week or two ago. In terms of when you're in retirement, as, as your question alludes to, it, it does raise the question, which one should you spend from first? One sort of rule of thumb is taxable, then traditional, and then Roth, the idea being Taxable won't trigger as much taxes because it's primarily capital gains long term, depending on your circumstances, and not 100% of what you take out will be taxed, again, subject to your circumstances. Uh, and, and that's on the one end, and you keep your Roth in there as long as possible to let it grow. But I think the reality is the analysis can be a little more complicated than that. One question is, if you plan to leave some of this, say, to your children, What's better for them? So, so you're you're looking at your tax situation, right? And this is where tax software or a tax accountant can help you because it gets really complicated because you're thinking about social security tax and the tax torpedo, as people call it. You're thinking about Medicare and the increased payments that you might have to make. Now, your income may be at a point where it's like it doesn't matter. So every situation is different, but that can you you may need to analyze that on a year by year basis. And then when you think about it long term, what will what are the tax rates for you if you say pull out traditional IRA, for example, versus what would the tax rates be for your children as best as you can guess if many years down the road you pass away, they inherit the traditional and they have to start taking the money out. Are they at the top tax bracket where it would crush them or maybe they're in the bottom tax? So there's all of these things to consider. So I don't, I, I, there is no rule of thumb, honestly, um, to answer that question. And tax software can help a little or retirement planning, but, um, you know, it's making assumptions about the tax laws and they're not going to change. It's not making any assumptions as far as I know about your children's situation, which may or may not be relevant to you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It depends. It's the best I got. All right. Hi, 
Hybrid cap, welcome. Finally able to hit a live. There you go. Is Colorado for real? I guess we'll find out, but they had a, an amazing game on Saturday. I hear their coach is a pretty good former football player and baseball. Mike says he's just started using AVGV, which is an Avantis all-in-one fund. I'll show it to you. It's kind of like, I guess it's similar to VT, which is a Vanguard fund, right? So here it is. Um, and if we go to the portfolio, we'll see that it's uh, more or less 100% equities, 60% or 61% in U.S. and 38, 39 in, uh, in foreign, international. It, it, as a lot of the Avantis funds do, it tilts towards value. I don't think VT tilts towards value. I could be wrong. Maybe it does. Let's look. No. So AV, AVGV tilts towards value and smaller companies, which I think is part of their sort of, as, as Mike points out, Fama French approach that Vanguard isn't really following or isn't following actually. By the way, I don't know which one will win out 30 years from now. I have no idea, but there you go. I think they're both reasonable funds for what that's worth. The Bulldogs want to see OSU. Are you sure about that? Because our place kicker was nailing the field goals. Nailing them. Just putting that out there. Something to think about. Uh, let's see here. Two questions for you tonight. All right. Let's see. See if I can find them. Here's the first one. My employer's 401k plan allows after-tax contributions and conversions or rollovers to my Roth IRA. Are those subject to the two Roth five-year rules that you've talked about? Okay, I'll give you my best answer with the following caveat. This gets really complicated and I'm not an expert, so you should just assume I'm wrong. Okay, so if you convert um, over to an IRA, I, I do believe the five-year rule on conversions would apply. Now, if you if you can roll it over, and I got an email from a viewer on this. If you can, if you can roll, if you can keep it in your 401k and just move it to the Roth, I don't know if the five-year conversion rule applies. But if I know if you convert it to a Roth IRA, it would apply. The other five-year rule, and, and by the way, the way the, the five-year rule works on conversions is every conversion gets analyzed separately. If you do 20 conversions in your lifetime, you've got 25 year, 20 five year periods you've got to keep track of. One for each conversion. Uh, and and uh, let's see. But once you turn 59 and a half, or otherwise can take out your money penalty free, my belief is the five year rule for conversions ends. And, and here's I'm pretty sure I'm right. Here's the way you think about it. I think the easiest way to understand the five-year rules, and there are two of them, we're only talking about one at the moment, is why they're there. So why does the IRS say, if you convert from, say, a, a traditional retirement account into a, a Roth IRA, why do you have to wait five years to avoid penalties? Well, let's assume that rule didn't exist. Uh, you could, and, and you're 55, let's just say, you could move from, and you want to take your money out of a traditional IRA. And let's say no exceptions apply. Uh, so you're going to pay tax, but you're also going to pay this 10% penalty. And you think, wait a minute, I think I can take contributions out of a Roth IRA at any time without penalty. So here's what I'll do. I'll convert it to a Roth. I'll pay taxes, but I, I'm going to have to pay taxes anyway. So I, I'm going to pay the tax on the conversion, but now it's in a Roth. I can take it out and no penalty. And um, so you're sort of, it would sort of allow you to get around 
the 10% penalty that applies to a traditional IRA. And the IRS said, yeah, we don't think so. So the way to, 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 to block that, so to speak, is this five-year rule. Um, but if you think about it, once you turn 59 and a half, you don't need to move the money over to a Roth IRA to avoid the penalty. You could have just taken it out of your traditional IRA, right? Of course, again, taxes, but no penalty. You're 59 and a half. And so once you turn 59 and a half, there's no need to have the five-year rule on conversions. Does that make sense? I think I'm right. Um, the other five-year rule, though, is um, you know to, to meet all of the rules on a Roth IRA, you have to have held uh, at least one Roth IRA for at least five years. So basically your oldest Roth IRA. And once you've had a Roth IRA for five years, you've satisfied the rule. It doesn't matter if you open up 37 other Roth IRAs and you've only had them open for four and a half days. It doesn't matter. Once you satisfy the this Roth five year, the Roth IRA five year rule, uh, you've satisfied it for all of them and forever. That's the good news. The bad news is once you turn 59 and a half, it doesn't save you. If you opened up the first Roth IRA at age 58, you got to wait five years. Whew. I think that's right. But the chat will correct me if I'm wrong. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Um, let me bump up here to Fast uh, Eddie. How long does the RMA tables go to? I believe they go to 115. Wait, RMAs. I'm thinking required minimum distributions. Is there an RMA table? I don't think so. I think you're talking about RMD table. I'm going to assume that's what you're talking about, or I just don't know. But let's see here. Where's the table? I'll, pull, I'll show you if I can find it. I like it when you Google a very specific thing and they take you to the IRS. Oh, here we go. But not this is what we want. Because you want, for most people, you want table. No, you just want the uniform life, lifetime table. And where is it? Man, these IRS documents are massive. I think it's in an appendix. Whew. Here we go. This is single life expectancy. Yeah, that's not what we want. We don't want table two. Well, you might if you have a spouse that's older, that's younger by more than 10 years. But I think the one that we'll look at is the one that I think most people Goodness. <laughs> uh, if I, if I missed it. Oh, here we go. But this is what I want. Well, let's see. There we go. Whoo. So it starts at 72, although now the age is 73. And it's going to go be going up. Does, yeah, it goes. It goes. To, I said 115. I was wrong. It goes to 120. So if you're 120, you have to take out half of your savings, right? Because you divide you divide your savings your in, you know in re, traditional retirement accounts subject to required minimum distributions by two. If you're yeah 20, 20 120 and over. So there you go. I think that's yeah. I think that's right. Okay. So John wants to know if multiple brokers are a good thing or a bad thing. Well, on the bad side, it's, you know, I guess it's a little more to manage, but like, you know, when you're using tools like Empower and, you know, for tracking your investments or at Fidelity, you could use Full FullView. Um, you can aggregate everything, right? Regardless of where it is. New retirement doesn't matter. It doesn't make new retirement or other retirement planning software any more difficult. The thing I like about multiple brokerages is it gives you some security if, I don't know, you get hacked. So I like the idea of multiple brokerages, personally. Oh, well, this is an interesting question um, from 
Graham, I guess. I don't know if I'm mispronouncing your name. Do you have any experience with or have you heard any reviews about New Retirement's advisor plan considering it as a CFP option, but haven't been able to find much about it yet? So I'm not a CFP, so I've not used it as a certified financial planner, uh, but I do know that it's an option. And I think it's well received and clients, from what I've heard, clients like it because as you can tell, they've done a lot of work on the user interface and we're only scratching the surface here. Um, but, you know, the charts and graphs and reporting are really good. And it's, 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 I think they do a good job of balancing complexity and ease of use. It does take some time to learn it. Uh, uh, but I mean, any, that's true of every single, what I'll call sophisticated retirement planning tool. Doesn't matter what they are. They all have a learning curve. Um, so I, I, I don't, uh, but I, but again, I've not used it as a CFP, but from the things that I've heard, it's been pretty well received. I don't know if that's helpful. Well, here's an interesting question from David. The bond fund in my 401k invests in VBTIX, no dividend or interest distributions into the bond fund, what good is a bond fund that does not provide income? I really find it hard to believe that it doesn't provide income. Oops, let's look at it. Yeah, this is just the total bond market index fund. It provides income. We can look at it. So for those that are new to Morningstar, I just typed in the ticker up here and it brought me out, hit enter, brought me to this page. There it is, VBTIX. And we can see the trailing 12 months, meaning over the last 12 months, it's generated just under 3%. Now, as we know, interest rates have been steadily climbing. So 12 months ago, it was lower than that. This past month, it was higher than that. But when you average it all out for 12 months, it's 3%. Now, uh, so that tells us it's distributing some income. Now, if we want to... Um, and I think they've changed some of this. Maybe not. If you go to performance, right, this just shows you the performance of the fund, but you can actually go to distributions. And green is income. You can see the up at top tells you what it is. Um, and so like in 2023, so let's see. So far it's produced 19 cents per share of income in 2023. Now, the thing to keep in mind, let's look at last year. Oh, by the way, and you can see it's producing income every month. I guess we can't look at last year, but let's, what I wonder, so with stock funds, their biggest dividend distribution is in December. I don't know if that's true of a bond fund. I was hoping I could look. It doesn't look like it is actually. One thing that's kind of interesting to me is that the distributions haven't grown that much. I guess they've gone from, you know, 0.0229 to 259. But in any event, yeah, it's it's definitely um, it's definitely producing income. By the way, they can also generate capital gains, right? Not when rates are going up so much, but. Josh wants to know what I think the I-bond rate will be uh, when it ch changes next. That's a good question. I haven't done any analysis of it. I can show you a website, though, that does. Um, I think it's right here. Let me, I'll show it to you once. Yeah. So it's this site. I don't know anything about them. Keel Financial Partners, how to buy I-bonds in August, 2023. And if you scroll down here, there's a deep thinker. I haven't watched that video. Um, there, you, so the next Inflation adjusted rate is obviously based on CPI data. And here's what they're projecting, 4.41%, um, but we don't know what the fixed rate's going to be. And there's no way to really, I mean, people guess, 
but it, you know, the treasury department sets it. So, um, but that's where they are at the moment. Yeah. So you can check out that website if you want. Okay. Hmm. This is from Paul. He says, I have a question. I'm 49. I'm taking long-term disability due to a stroke. My wife still works and makes a nice living. Other than a taxable account, is there anywhere I can put my money? Well, you guys might, depending on your, your insurance, you might have a, a health savings account, right? If you have a high deductible plan. And then I'm embarrassed to say I don't know a lot about spousal IRAs. Um. But that's something I would look into. And I'll just pull up. This is just from Investopedia. Um, I just saw the summary and then it. Here we go. A spouse of IRA is a strategy that allows a working spouse to contribute to an IRA in the name of the non-working spouse with no income or very little income. This is an exception to the provision that individuals must have earned income, which is you know, normally the rule. Uh, to contribute. However, the working spouse's income must equal or exceed the total IRA contributions made on behalf of both spouses. So that would be something you could look into. I've never personally, we've ne we never had a spousal IRA, so I don't have any experience with them. So I don't know, you know, the thing you always have to make sure of is there are no gotchas. Everything with the IRS, there's the potential for gotcha. Um, but that's so that you can look into that. Um, Those are the two things that come to mind. I, I'm sure there could, Paul, there could be things I'm missing. <laughs> really, you guys should just assume assume that. What's Rob missing? Okay. <laughs> uh, David says, "Hey, Rob, I just can't watch you live. Glad to see you today. Given the upbeat topic, yeah." Well, this is interesting. Rob Harris says that Vanguard uh, financial defaults to a life expectancy of 100 years. Uh-oh. Coca Lita will live to be 190. Here's the thing about, so you could be okay living to 190. Um, although I don't know if I can actually show that here. So this is FI Calc. By the way, they've been updating this tool. I, I, I've shown this on the show many times. And I'm just looking at it. They've they've really updated some stuff here. I have to. I haven't seen it since they they added some. Looks like some fun things. Here's the deal. This is an this is a million dollar portfolio. We're going to ignore annuities, ignore social security, and when we're going to assume forty thousand spend the first year just for inflation. So this is basically the four percent rule, right? And um, boy, this has really changed. Oh, look, they've got an ad for, for electric bikes. It's like it's changed so much. <gasps> I'm not sure what to do. Constant dollar. I'm going to change this for a second. I see. So it just updates. Okay. So, so we have a 96.7% chance of success, which makes sense. We're following the 4% rule. The reason it's not 100 is probably because it's using different data. Well, let me look at all oh, the asset allocations. It's got 5% in cash. Let's make that zero and make bonds 20. Oops. I don't know that that's going to change anything. That eh, bumped it up a little bit. But of course, we know if we go to like 45,000, it's going to start going down 92.7, right? But if we go the other way, and let's go extreme, let's say 25,000, that's only 2.5% spend rate, right? 100%, right? Well, what if we go to 40 years? 100%. What if we go to 50 years? 100%. How about 60? 100. Can we get, will, will it ever go down? What happens? Look, 80, 80 years, sex rate, success rate is still 100%. Let's do 100. Wait, how long are you going to live? 190. Is it, will it do 190 years? 
It, no, it, it ran out. How about 100 years? 100% success. The point is, because you're taking out so little relative to the million, you're earning more money. It snowballs. Look, your median portfolio value when you die at 65, assuming you, you retired at 65 and live 100 years, is 132 million bucks. Can you see that down here? The average is 180 million. The largest $682 million. You know what amazes me about that number? $682 million. You're not quite to a billion. And people like Musk and Buffett have over 100 of those. Okay. I don't have any idea if any of that was helpful at all. Kate is from Hawaii. Welcome. Honolulu, to be specific. I've never been to Hawaii. It's one of the few states I've never been to. I've been to almost every state, but not Hawaii. Okay. Oh, important question. Mr. B55, are those built-in cabinets behind you? They are not. Those are IKEA cabinets. I know my image has just been shattered or uplifted, depending on your perspective. I've put those cabinets together, I think, 47 times. I hate those cabinets. Well, putting them together. They, they function quite nicely. Hmm. So Josh wants to know, if you got 20 years before you retire, is it a good idea to put some percentage of your bond allocation in 20-year treasuries if most of your bonds are already intermediate? Well, I guess my question would be why, right? I mean, I think, I guess the theory might be they'll mature when I retire, and then I guess you spend that money. Uh, maybe that funds your first so many years of retirement. If it's 5 to 10%, maybe 2 to 3 years, I guess it depends how much you're spending. I don't, for me, I just, I don't know. I like the simplicity of just keeping it in an intermediate term bond fund. I don't, I don't know that, how would it help you? I guess, I'm trying to think how it would help you by putting it in 20 year treasuries. If rates went down, the value of those would go up, but you're going to hold them to maturity. So that, that won't help you, right? Because when they mature, well, I guess you could sell them, but if you don't sell them, they mature at par. Um, and you know, your interest is going to be, you know, whatever the, the coupon rate is when you buy the 20 year treasuries, it's probably, what are, what are 20 years? Are they selling 20 years? Treasury yields. Let's see. Twenty years, four forty-eight. I mean, it's a good it's a good rate. Of course, if rates go up, it won't look good once you bought it. If they go down, you'll look like a genius. Um, I have no opinion on that. So I I just I'm trying to think of why what advantage that would give you, and I'm struggling to come up with an advantage, you know, over just an intermediate term bond fund. I mean, I, some people like the comfort of owning a bond fund that they can control when it's when if ever it's sold. I, I don't personally find that all that comforting. But but I, I get that sentiment. Yeah, I'm trying to I can't think of a reason why I would do that, Josh. It doesn't mean you shouldn't. So Caroline, or Carolina, excuse me, in terms of how long do you expect to live, she says, I, I don't expect to live long, 80s, and have no, no heirs. How does that change things? Well, um, the first question would be, why do you expect not to live past your 80s? Now, there might be a good answer to that, right? Some It could be a health issue and family history. But, but I would still always ask the question, but what if I do? I don't expect to live past my 80s, but what if I do? And, and, and I would at least stress test a retirement plan personally is what I, I do. And I, again, I'm going to have a video on there's other ways to stress test a retirement plan beyond just how long you're going to live. Um, 
but I would still be always asking that question and thinking through, you know, how I would pay for my retirement if I did live into my 90s or even 100. Um, yeah, so um, the fact that you don't have, you, you know, your, your money is going to go to someone. Maybe you're going to give it to charity. So it's going to go to somebody. Now, if it goes to charity, um, that will change your tax analysis, right? Because the charities won't be paying taxes. Um, I don't know if a charity inherits an IRA. I guess they don't pay taxes, right? I don't think so. Taxes on IRA contribution to a charity. I know you can give a qualified charitable contribution. Yeah, I don't think they pay taxes. But again, take with a grain of salt anything I say about taxes. So, I mean, I, I think I would still stress test your retirement plan. But again, I don't know the specific details of your situation and why you don't expect to live past your 80s. Um, and also, you know, think about if I did live to be 100, how would I pay for it? And if I want to go forward with that assumption, how will it affect my spending today? And um, it, it may be a minor difference or it may be a major difference. And, and then you have just some choices to make, right? But I think the first step is understanding, you know, they almost kind of think of it like a sensitivity analysis, right? Like we saw with new retirement and the demo data, Let's see if I've still got it up. Yeah, with the demo data, remember I, this is the lived 100, and it brought the chance of success from 87 to 84%. Well, that's not a big change. Uh, you know, I wonder if one would have to do anything different. I mean, you know, because your, your goal here is not 100%. Um, so, you know, you, you can, the, the impact on your plan may be relatively minor, or it, it could be very significant, and then you just have choices to make. But the starting point is understanding what that is, right? Okay. Mike says, thanks for introducing me to new retirement a while back. Makes it easy to test different longevity scenarios. Yeah. And the thing, the thing about all of these retirement planning tools, including new retirement, the ben one of the big benefits is you can start with a base plan and then start going through what if scenarios. Like, like what if I live to be 100? Or what if I claim Social Security early or late? Or what if I work an extra year or retire a year early? How is that going to affect everything? That's really where you start to understand your retirement plan. And because we have all these different levers we can pull, some make no not much difference at all. You may, you may, you, you know, you may be planning to retire at 65 and you say, well, what if I retire a year early and you do the crunch the numbers and you're like, yeah, it doesn't make a big difference at all. So yeah, maybe I will retire a year early or maybe it makes a huge difference, you know, I mean, and so that's how, you, it's the only way I know of to figure that out is to do those what if scenarios. And again, different, you have a couple things here, by the way, you have that you can create, you know, scenarios with different assumptions, um, but then they also have different what ifs you can run, right? Live five years longer than expected. So that's like a built in what if your health conditions deteriorate, you get a, you know, a better return or a worse return. So they have a, you have a couple of different ways to model different things. Okay. Vinyl says, maybe Elon Musk is watching. You never know. I think he's too busy. I think about his life. It sounds, it's just so unappealing to me. I, I wouldn't want that for anything. I mean, it's like, I just don't know how he has any time for anything. Okay. Let's see. Passive 101 says that Fidelity has a solo vid folio that works like M1 Finance, but is $5 a month. They allow separate goals like Betterment. What do you think of this? I think it's worth checking out. I guess the question, so uh, why would you choose it 
over, let's say, um, M1 Finance, given that there's a cost? Well, I think there's a good answer to that. You, you'd like Fidelity. It's obviously um, um, a well-known company. It offers a lot of features that M1 Finance doesn't. You may have other assets there and you like to keep it in one place. And it's just five bucks a month. And Fidelity didn't pay me for that opinion. I wish they would. I would love to have Fidelity as a sponsor. But at least I haven't actually reached out to them and asked. Here's the, is it Fidfolio? Fidfolio? Fidfolios? I don't know. I really think the marketing could have been a little better here. But it's a basic idea. It's very, I've not used it, but my understanding is it works very similar to M1 Finance. No. Uh, to me, Betterment is very different than 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 M1 Finance or the the, the Fidelity Vid Folio. The one thing about about um, you, you do need to be careful about. You know, in a retirement account, it doesn't matter because you could, if you decide, you know, I want to go to simplicity, I'm going to go to three fund portfolio. You can sell everything, no taxes, because you're in a IRA, and then move it somewhere else and put it in a three fund portfolio, or leave it at Fidelity or M1. And you know, if you're a taxable account, you know, you start to get crazy with your little pies, and you have 37 different positions, and five years go by and you've done well, but you've got these capital gains built in, so you might be stuck at least from a tax perspective. It's one of the reasons I think these direct indexing uh, offers, and Fidelity has that too for 40, it was 40 basis points last time I checked. I'm just not a fan of them. I think you get locked in with capital gains and then you just, you're, you're stuck paying the fees forever. So John wants to know if we can count our social security as bonds. It's interesting you ask that so in the newsletter I sent out Sunday, there was an article that I considered at, including, I didn't. Let me see if I can find it. Um, here it is. Yeah, so it was, I didn't include this. It was one of the ones I read, I, I go through probably a hundred articles to pick three. Well, I picked more than three, but related to retirement. And this was one of them that I almost included. I don't think I included it. The Place of Social Security in Your Retirement Portfolio. It's by Alan Roth, who's a well-known financial planner, does a lot of writing. He goes to the Bogleheads every year. I saw him last year. By the way, I'm going to that. It's here in D.C. So, if um, you know, last year we did a meetup and had dinner. We, I'm happy to do the same thing if folks want to go. In fact, let me just get an idea with a poll. Are you going to the Bogleheads conference? Uh, anyway, back to this. I think what he said, if I remember correctly, was he, he would include a pension as part of the bonds, but not Social Security. Let's see. I wouldn't include either. Anyway, you can check out the article uh, for his rationale. My rationale is, you know, you've got this nest egg. And once you've accounted for your guaranteed income, Social Security, pension, annuities, um, do you have to take more, more, do you need more money that's going to come out of your retirement savings? If the answer is no, then, you know, invest how you want. I'd probably be heavy in equities because I don't need it. So it's, I'm a long-term investor. <laughs> At least I, well, <laughs> I don't know when I'm going to leave this rock. Hopefully I'm a long-term investor. Uh, but if you do need money, I think your asset allocation needs to, needs to be based on how much you need to take out of that portfolio each year. I mean, you know, if you look at the 4% rule and all the literature, not just Bill Bingen's 94 paper, but all the literature, they talk about how important stock to bond asset allocation is and, de and depending on what percentage you're taking out. But basically, if it's anywhere near 4%, you need somewhere between 50 and 75% in stocks. So uh, to me, trying to value a pension or an annuity or social security and then stuff it into the portfolio as a part of the bond portfolio, 
I think it overcomplicates everything and, and just completely unnecessary. I believe Alan had a, a slightly different view and you can check it out. Oh, there, there's the article. You should be able to find it. He just published it a couple of weeks ago. How's the poll going? Anyone going to this thing? Okay, so 10 of you so far are going. Good. Well, um, we'll figure it out, but we'll love to get dinner one night. I think last time we just did, we, we did it in the hotel. Um, and that worked out well. Okay. Actually, um, clownfish, 007 clownfish. The perpetual withdrawal rate, I think the studies show it's higher than 2.5. I think it's closer to 3.5. And you know who's done a lot of work on this is, is it, I don't think it's portfolio charts. Maybe it is. I think, it, yeah, it's this website. Portfolio charts. Um, so the idea behind it is you, what percent can you take out that protects the original principal balance on an inflation adjusted basis? And I'm pretty sure it's a neat website, by the way, if you've never checked out portfolio charts. I think. Perpetual projected, yeah, 3.4. That's a, you, the 30 year mark. It goes up because in the early years, anything can happen, but given enough time, yeah, I thought it was three and a half. So that's pretty close. But again, you got to always keep in mind it's making assumptions total stock market, intermediate term bonds. Okay. MJ points out that once you die, you won't know whether you were right or not. I guess I can't argue with that. This is a question that I think is beyond the scope of, 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 of the live Q&A. Yippie wants to know, if I have myself frozen and they're able to revive me in the year 2345, or 2345 if you prefer, how much money will I need? It's a good question. All right. Huh. I'll, 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 I'll leave this. Doug. Garbage. The percentage of people living to 100 is a fraction of the population. Nice way to force your sponsor on people. Hmm. That doesn't seem very nice. You think that's what I'm doing? Well, OK. All right. So here's a question. Why not base life expectancy on your parents' and grandparents' age of death, plus, say, five years? So here's how I think about this. First of all, my dad died at 39 in a car accident, so that wouldn't help me. Uh, I never knew my grandparents, my grandfather on either side. Um, my grandmothers both lived, I guess, well into their 80s. I think they were both smokers, though. And I don't smoke. You see all the issues? Um, the point of assuming you're going to live to be a, a much older age than you're likely to live, right, which is why I assume 100, um, uh, is because it, it's kind of like buying insurance. It's like, you know, you could say, well, why do I need to insure my house? The odds that it's going to burn down or get hit by a tornado or next to nil, right? I, I probably do have a greater chance of living to 100 than a tornado hitting my house. Yet I have insurance against a tornado hitting my house. Why? Well, because if a tornado hits my house, it, it, it creates a very significant loss that I couldn't otherwise afford to sustain. And it turns out that 
because it's so unlikely, the cost actually isn't that bad. Now, of course, if you live, you know, if you live on the beach somewhere and you have hurricane insurance, it's probably quite expensive. But the thing about assuming you're going to live to be 100 is that I don't think for a lot of people it's going to require dramatic changes to what you're doing. So, of course, every situation is different. So that's why you got to do the analysis yourself. So uh, Tom wants to know about agency bonds uh, at 6% plus. So I don't know a thing about agency bonds. Uh, you know, one question I would have is, why are they paying above market rates? Is there some additional risk involved in the bonds, right? I mean, because that's significantly above. If we go back to the yields, see if I still got it up. I might not, but they were around what? Four and a half percent. So there's got to be some additional risk you're taking. I don't know what it is, but I otherwise why, they wouldn't need to pay six plus percent, right? And that risk may or may not be worth taking. I can't answer that for you, but all right. What else do we have? Yeah, um, I agree with you. He says, I, Peng says, I haven't finished reading Die With Zero because I, uh, of its seeming anti-work ethos. I'm more of the journey is the joy kind of guy. I, um, I, I've i really re redefined for myself the idea of work. Um, I, I wouldn't want work that required me to commute for 45 minutes each way and spend you know nine to five in an office. But, you know, I think people kind of can get hung up on, are you really retired? So, so, so a lot of people say, well, you, Rob, you earn an income, so you're not retired. Okay. I'm not sure that l putting me in one bucket or another is, is the most useful. I certainly feel, uh, I'm not sure if the word is retired. I have total control over how I spend my day, total control and where, and I like what I'm doing, right? Um, it's like someone who just loved golfing. And they wanted to go off four or five times a week. And that's all they did. You'd say they're retired. Unless they're on the senior tour, now it's a job. Okay, so how has that helped us? <laughs> well, they're, they're golfing. Um, and and I, so, yeah, this idea of you, you shouldn't be, do, you, should, you should enjoy life, not work. I, I think that really... For some people, that might mean doing something that generates no income. It might, but I, I don't think that's for everybody. Let's see, what else we got? Susan has a question. Yeah, just made it. Question. Do you increase your annual withdrawal amount by the inflation rate? Or do you use a personal inflation rate to make this decision? Well, I think of it in terms of what we're actually spending. N not the CPI numbers that come out of Washington. Uh, now, I suppose if my spending was going up significantly more than CPI, I, that my, I, I would have to look at that and understand why. Um, I think the assumption, if you think about it from an academic perspective, like Bill Bingen and his 94 paper, he's got to make an assumption about how inflation is going to affect spending. He can't use a personal inflation rate, right? Because everyone is different. He's got, he's got to pick something ob, you know, objective and quantifiable. And so there you go, CPI. Uh, and, and that's why, while a lot of these papers can be very useful, when you then get to actually sitting down yourself and figuring out what you should do, you're going to find yourself 
deviating in some way from the academic paper. And I think that's okay. So uh, Rick wants to know, do you, do you do Roth conversions based on the assumption of taxes going up after, you know, the, I guess it would start in 2026. Uh, I, that's what I'm doing. Now, I haven't done any analysis yet this year as to whether I should do Roth conversions, but I will do it. And I, that's the assumption that I will make. I, you know, I mean, of course, we don't know what's going to happen, but that's how the law is currently, you know, works. So that's that's what I would assume. <laughs> Vinyl says, go Bucks. That is the actual bucks in your brokerage account. I don't know, Vinyl. I think you could have just stopped at Go Bucks. That would have been good. Um, Jim says, if you don't have legacy issues, doesn't an annuity always make sense? I wouldn't say so. I mean, I suppose the argument would be let's annuitize everything. I'm not, I don't have any interest in leaving money to anybody. And I'm guaranteed some monthly amount until I die. But keep in mind that annuities are not adjusted for inflation. You do take on the risk of issues with the insurance company. Now, you can spread that out by buying annuities from different companies. You also lose control. You know, what if you need to spend more money two years from now? You know, there might be ways to deal with that. And there are different kinds of annuities. But I personally wouldn't assume that uh, annuities always make sense just because you, you don't have family, let's say, that you want to leave money to. That's my opinion. I guess everything I say is my opinion, now that I think about it. All right. I had an epiphany. Um, I won't go into the details. because it, it was on a religious issue. But I had a someone um, who I think very highly of, very smart, articulate, logical. And they expressed an opinion on, uh, I call it a religious issue, but it was about a specific individual. I didn't know, it's, you know, no one that either one of us know, and I'd never heard of this person. And I did some digging about this person, and I had this aha moment because it, it was clear to me that my friend saw this person in a very different light than I do. I mean, night and day different. And it, it kind of uh, emphasized for me the need to think for ourselves. Now, that's not to say we can't take opinions from others that we value, listen to them, try to understand them, um, work them into our own belief system, whether it's about religion or retirement planning or, you know, whatever. Um, but you you really, you need, really need to get comfortable thinking through these issues on your own and coming to your own decision as best you can. I, I say as best you can because some of these topics are really complicated. And, you know, sometimes you just, sometimes, you know, you, you have to, to some extent, trust an expert. You think about medical issues, for example. But boy, I think it's really important to do your own research and thinking on these issues and coming to your own conclusions. Okay. Well, this is a tough one. Um, 57, hoping to retire at 62. Pension will cover 60% of spending and no investments except for $200,000 equity in the house. Should we sell the house now to fund a 403B? Pension will cover 60%. What about Social Security? Um, if you sell your house, where are you going to live? Right. That's. I, I don't know if you're going to rent. See, this is where, honestly, I would use a retirement planning tool, whether it's one I talk about or one you come up with on your own, because you can you can put these scenarios into the tool. Um. And I think it'll give you a lot of insight that you can use to answer that question. Uh, but there's something about th that idea that just doesn't resonate with me. And of course, you know, you couldn't put all the money in the 403B at once, right? Because there's contribution limits. So um, 
but I there's something that just that doesn't resonate with me as a, as a way to solve this issue. Um, it, it may be that you, you do need to tap your equity and there are different ways to do that and, and at different times. Um, and, and maybe maybe you need to work past 62. Don't know if that's an option. But I would consider all of these things before I would go off and sell my house to start funneling more money. Of course, you can't put the sale proceeds into the 403B, but I guess you could increase your contributions from your paycheck and then make up for that lost money through the sale of the house. But still, I, I don't know. My, my instinct tells me that would be an option of last resort. It, I, I just wonder if it raises as many issues as it solves. But, you know, there'd be a ton of details one would need to, to, to know to really think through all of the possible ramifications of that. Mike gives his perspective on die with zero. I don't disagree with any of this. But, you know, like today, we had a great Labor Day. Um, uh, family came over. We played cards, swam in the pool. Well, I didn't, but they did. Um, I did some reading, went to yoga. I mean, that's not every day. Yes, yeah, sometimes we go on vacation. But I just... I don't know. It just doesn't re generally require a lot of money for me to enjoy life. I don't know. Maybe I'm not thinking hard enough on that topic. Uh, yeah. So there are like six people at Dollar Chat and 340 here. So Dave, just so you know, I, I stream this to the Facebook groups, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, the Dough Roller uh, group was very vibrant when I owned Dough Roller five plus years ago. I, I did buy it back as part of buying the site, but I've not done much with it and probably won't, uh, largely because I just don't have the time. There's just, you know, there's only so many things you can do. So Tab wants to know, any thoughts on leveraged ETFs? If we've talked about leveraged ETFs before, I just don't feel a need for them. And I think they, um, are, you know, add risk and I just don't see them as a meaningful way for long-term investors. There could be some trading strategies where maybe they make sense, but I just don't have any use for them personally. All right. Who runs, so uh, if by that you mean the website, I do, but we're still in the process of making, of cleaning it up. Um, and that's going to take the rest of this year. It's a lot of work. Um, the, the company that owned it and they did this, they, they owned several other personal finance sites. I didn't like the direction they went with the site in, in some regards. In, uh, in other cases, it, you know, some of the content was quite good, but um, yeah, and we're, we're, we're narrowing the focus significantly of the site as well. You know, when I owned it originally, it was sort of about all personal finance. It's not going to be that. We're going to narrow it down. Um, but that's still a work in pro process, progress, process. All right. Brett wants to know if new retirement can model an existing stretch IRA. Well, um, let's see here. I don't know is the short answer. Um, I'm adding an account. Um, I guess they don't have inherited IRA. It would be a traditional me manual entry, stretch IRA balance, we'll just throw in 100,000. Yeah, I don't know that it does. That's a good question. Because um, the point being, for those that aren't familiar, is there's an RMD that, that gets taken out every year. Um, and I don't know, I've never modeled one, even though I actually have one, but it's so small that it just, 
I didn't worry about modeling it. I'll look into that. I don't know, uh, Brett. It's a good question. Will wants to know, at what overall bond percentage should one think about diversifying bonds, or do you just go all in on treasuries because they are safer? I can just say what my approach is, Will. Uh, for a long time, it was just a total bond uh, market fund, which includes more than just treasuries. It includes some, some asset-backed uh, bonds and um, some investment-grade corporate bonds. More recently, I've included TIPS. But beyond that, I think that, I mean, I, I do own some T-bills, but that's just for like emergency funds and money I'm going to spend in the next year. Um, other, So I don't, I, to me, that's pretty diversified. Um, and you can do that with really just two funds. All right. So... Doug wants to know, Douglas wants to know about uh, Dr. Fowles' retirement income, RISA. What's it stand for? I'll show it to you. Income Style Awareness Profile. There it is. I, I took this. I actually like the idea behind it. And so the idea is, if you think about Think about the question, should you annuitize some of your retirement? Well, the problem with trying, you can't, you can't answer that question entirely by with math, right? Because you have to make assumptions. You have to, like we talked about earlier, you have to assume how long you're going to live. You've got to assume what market returns are going to be and inflation, all these other things. And so you, you can make assumptions and do the analysis, but then, you know, there's no way to know if those assumptions are right. Or put another way, we know they're going to be wrong. We just don't know how wrong they're going to be, right? So, um, but the point of this, at least this is my view of it. I don't know if Dr. Fowl would agree with this, but is that part of the decision on, on a question like, should you buy an annuity, comes down to your personality, comes down to your own sense of, of fear to some extent, and what you need to be comfortable with your retirement plan. Um, and so you go through a series of questions. I think you have to pay for this. Um, and I'm trying to find, they had, uh, let me see if I can find the quadrant that they had. Why can't, uh, let me, let me try a different search. I'm surprised it didn't come up on the website. Let's see. Well, we, I can find it on Kitsy's, Kitsa's website from a year ago. Um, so here's the four. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger. There we go. Um, and so, you know, safety first and optionality, you know, options. Safety first and commitment. So that might be an annuity, right? Probability based. If you think about what that means is, um, I did not mean to do that. Oh, there we go. If you think about the four percent rule, that's probability based, right? I mean, we're you know we're we're bake, we're we're we're, bake, we're we're basing that off of the likelihood of something, whether you're using Monte Carlo analysis or historical data, um, and these different options, um, these different quadrants will lead to different kinds of retirement products. I pr I know I was probability based over here. I'm pretty sure I was probability based in optionality. Um, I took that and actually was going to do a video on it, which I never did. I probably should. Um, so I took it, you know, some time ago. Um, I wonder if I can log into my account. How did I do that? It's been a while. Yeah, I'm not going to try to figure that out. But um, I, I like the idea behind it. There, you probably already know how you feel about it before you take the, the test. But it's something you can do. I want to say it costs $25, but I could be wrong about that. It wasn't expensive, as I recall. When that, see, now they've changed it. I don't know what this is. So you've got this Retirement Researcher Academy. That's kind of expensive. I don't think that's what it is, though. I think there's some other account. But they, they've changed their website since I've, I've been here last.
Because now this retirement academy is first year membership fee of $14.95 and then annual new of $3.95. I don't know about that. So that's not what I paid. I don't know if you can, can you take it? And see, now I want to know. Can you take this test? They actually had, you see, it's, it's weird how they've done this. I don't know. I'll have to look into that. That's not the way the site was set up when I, I did this not that long ago, like within the last six months. Okay. How are we doing on time? 821. Holy cow. Let's see. So question uh, from Sarah, my view of adding commodities like gold and retirement funds. I generally don't feel a need for gold. It, it's not an income. It's not a, I don't want to, it's not an income producing asset. You know, they, they dig it up in, 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 in other parts of the world, but ship it here and we bury it. Um, you're going to get exposure to commodities just through a total stock market fund, right? Including gold, by the way. Um, I don't see any reason to take on more of that commodity. I don't think it's a hedge against inflation. There are times when it, it, it appears to be 70s are the no notable case, um, but I don't think it's a hedge. I will say this. If you want to invest in gold, do not use a gold IRA. They get, I, I was complaining about I, on Apple news, I got all these CBS news articles about gold and, and they were just thinly veiled attempts to get you to sign up for gold. So CBS news can make money. And I've got, I got no complaint about people making money online. Um, but the thing that, 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 that you, you don't see is the markups that these gold IRAs charge you. They'll talk about no fees or low fees to set up the IRA. But what are, the, what are the spreads on the gold they're selling you? And some of them are outrageous. Um, and it's just so much easier to buy gold in a different way if you want to, like in an ETF. But I'm not personally, I don't own any gold. I'm not saying I never would. Um, but I just don't really see a need for it. Now, you know, if you look at different time periods, including maybe the last 20 years, um, gold might do pretty well. Let's see here. Let's compare, uh, let's do this real quick. So I'm in Portfolio Visualizer. Let's first do 72 to 2003. Let's just compare US stock market with gold. I'm not sure how much data, um, whoops. How much data portfolio visualizer has on gold it may not go all the way back to 1972 let's see it does see and um so the market u.s market you know trashes it but what what you notice here is that for the first goodness all the way up into you know we started in 72 it wasn't until 90 that there was a crossover but that's because of this massive run up of gold in the 70s after, you know, which has a lot to do with the gold, removing from the gold standard and all of that and the tough market. Um, so, you know, you can see gold does well and even all the way up to the 2008 crisis, it almost caught up. Look here, it actually passed it, 2011. So I can't tell you that owning gold in certain amounts in certain scenarios might be a, a smart thing to do. Um, I just don't find it necessary and I don't have enough confidence in gold to pull the trigger on it. And, and let me show you a different um, scenario because this is a more likely, you know, I don't know anyone that's got 100% gold. But what some people might say, and Sarah, this may be part of your question really, what about a small amount like 10%? Well, when we analyze these two portfolios, the, the portfolio with a little bit of gold, look, it outperforms and the standard deviation, meaning the volatility of that portfolio is lower, significantly lower than just the US market. Now, before we get too excited about gold, though, as even, even in a small 
allocation. I've kind of cherry picked. I mean, yes, this is the, the oldest year you can put into portfolio visualizer. So it doesn't look like I've cherry picked, but I really have. Because if we go to 82, I suspect the results will be very different. I could be wrong. Let's find out. Maybe I am wrong. No, yeah, way, way down. Um, still lower on the standard deviation, the volatility, but the returns have gone down. S the 70s was a big, big decade for gold. And when you take out that decade, gold loses its, you know, its shine. Um, now, you might say, well, Rob, you've cherry picked a year again. Well, that's true. We go to 2000, gold's probably going to help us. We'll see. Or not hurt us as much. Yeah, it helped us. From 2000, we actually do a little better with 10% in gold. And again, standard deviation is lower. Why? Well, because stocks got walloped in the 2000, 2002 period, although gold didn't do great either. They got walloped again uh, in the Great Recession. And so, you know, there you go. I, I point this out because, because it's just, it's data, it's facts. I still don't invest in gold, but I can't say that some small allocation to gold is a mistake. And who knows, the day could come when I change my mind and I put a little money in gold. But I don't plan to do that right now. So Jeff says he's a year out from retirement, never used a financial advisor, but I think I need some advice on how to be tax smart moving forward. Yeah, that I definitely. Should I hire a CPA, a tax lawyer? Help. Um, well, any of those might work. What I, Here's my experience with CPAs that I hire to prepare my taxes. And I've had a number of them over the years. And as, as things got more complicated, I sw switched. You know, I had one that was really good, but not great with small businesses. And then, um, and so, uh, but, but the thing I found is they're not great at retirement planning and helping you think through all of the issues. This is a, 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 a huge generalization just based on my own personal experience. It's not that they don't know the tax laws, but it's, it's almost, I almost get the feeling that they're sort of just in the tax preparation business, and they'll do a little bit of planning with you. I have found working with a financial planner to be more helpful. But what I don't want to do is hire someone to manage my investments and pay them a you know, percentage of assets under management. So one thing you can do, if you Google um, best low cost fixed rate, I'm not sure, um, financial advisor, Yeah, my site comes up pretty high in the list, and I've got this low cost list of low cost financial advisors. You can check these folks out. By the way, I don't get paid. They don't pay me anything. No one's been paid. I paid me to be on this page. I don't get any fees from them. You want to do your own due diligence. Um, I think Mark Zorl, he's one that I've used personally. I like Mark. Um, I know Rick personally. I know Jack. So you know, they all have sort of different services they offer, but you might at least check out that list. All right. I can't believe we're to the end already. It's 829. I'm scrolling to the bottom. Let's see. Okay, we'll end with this. Why do I always look to the right when you end the live chat? So you can't see this, but I have two giant monitors, one over here and one over here. Um, this one shows me everything that you see when I hit that button. It also shows me if I want to go to the YouTube live stream. And by the way, I'm glad I did. I need to end this poll. So this is your chat over here. This is me a few seconds or minutes behind. This shows me how many concurrent viewers, 429 at the moment, although that's just with YouTube, um, right? And then this screen, which you never see, uh, not that there's anything to see, but it shows me 
the chat as well, but where I can click your question and pull it up on the screen. So I'm trying to think if this makes me look to the right or that, I don't know. But that's what's going on behind the scenes. And um, that's why I tend to look left. I look left. I look both ways. I don't know. Um, I guess that's it. I'm just looking at the last few. I always like to end the show with a non-financial question. I guess that was a non-financial question. So there you go. So let's see here. Before we end, though, I do want to look at my calendar to make sure I'm, I'm going to be here two weeks from, from now. I think I will be. You know, Lord willing and the creek don't rise. So on the 18th of September, I will be back. Uh, so until then, you know, hope you have a great week. I will have some more videos coming out. I do want to do the one on stress testing. Um, I, I have one on tracking portfolios that I, I have in mind. I have several. So hopefully I'll get some of those out this week and more next week. And that's it. So hope uh, you enjoyed the show. Hope you have a great night, uh, rest of your evening, and a great week. Until next time, remember, the best thing money can buy is financial freedom. See, and I'm looking right. Because then from here, I can click the button that ends 